So I, I actually had made you the host, Dr. Izik. So the floor is yours yeah. now. Sure, Dr. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, very uh, clear. Very clear, right? Okay. All right, I think we can start now. Uh, first thing first, I would like to say uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to Prof Karim. I believe it's uh, 8 a.m. in the UK. And uh, basically, good day to everybody in this room. So we are honored to have all you here, uh, the valuable audience, uh, and welcome to the adjunct professor public lecture series number one, organized by Architecture Program University Technology Malaysia. Uh, for your for your information, uh, this is our first lecture series with our appointed adjunct professor to talk about the each friendly housing environments that is the Odessa project. And with this, let me bid a sincere welcome to our adjunct professor, Dr. Karim Adri, who is also the head for the School of Architecture, University of Sheffield, United Kingdom. And not to forget the audience present here today, which I believe not only from Malaysia or from the UK but also other countries as well. We are honored to have you all here with us and thank you for joining our adjunct professor public lecture series number one. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Isaac from University Technology Malaysia. I'll be responsible for hosting the session today, uh, for keeping the time and also to monitor any questions coming from the audience throughout the session. Together with me in this room, we have the Director for Architecture Program, University of Technology Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Ali Sabrina. And of course, before we begin with the lecture from our Honourable Speaker, Prof Karim, allow me to invite the Director of Architecture Program, University of Technology Malaysia, to give a welcoming remark to our session today. Please welcome Dr. Ellis. The room is yours for the moment. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, the moderator, Dr. Izik Efifi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning uh, to Prof, Dr. Prof Karim from uh, Sheffield University. And also good afternoon to all my colleagues here from Indonesia, from India, and also from Malaysia. And uh, welcome and selamat datang to this first adjunct professorial public lecture talk organized by the University of Technology Malaysia Faculty Build Environment and Surveying and also School of Architecture UTM. So thank you so much uh, from the deepest of my heart to the honorable guest speaker again, adjunct professor Prof Karim Hajri for his willingness to give his first public lecture as a adjunct professor. And also, as you can see that uh, we are actually honored because uh, Prof Karim had uh, been uh, accepting our invitation and uh, delighted actually to share his interests and in each area focusing on the issue of housing across the globe. And for today's topic, I think it is a very interesting topic because he'll be focusing on the Odessa project that will look into the um, elderly housing. And we are now talking about the aging society and this is one of the most big challenge faced by most countries in the world nowadays, especially the developed and the uh, well-developed states, talking about the issue of housing and human settlements. So I hope that today's intellectual discourse will actually start become a starting point, uh, not only to spark the discourse on housing and human settlements in the 21st century, but uh, give the best option and approaches and also proposition to academicians to give the best ideas and input and how to improve the quality and of life and especially on the way how we live in. So as Winston Churchill always mentioned, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So the mother art is architecture and without an architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. And as you can see that all every great architect is necessarily like a great poet. He must be a great original interpreter of his time, his day, and also his age. So today's discourse with Sheffield University and with uh, University of Technology Malaysia is actually a stepping stone to build a collaborative partnership and to build a new networking in terms of research and academic between both schools and institutions. And also UTM is especially is looking into the future ahead to establish a research center also in focusing on housing and human settlements. And so therefore, I hope that all the input that we gain today can be an impetus that actually sparks the change for the future. So thank you again so much to Prof. Dr. Karim Hajri from Sheffield University. And also I wish today everyone the very best and I'm looking forward for our collaboration with Sheffield University in the future. Thank you so much. So I pass it back to you, the moderator, Dr. Isik. 
All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis, for the welcoming remark. Uh, all right. For the viewers of this lecture series, uh, I will attach the link to attendance form in the chat box towards the end of the session. And please be noted to fill in the required details along with your email to get your e-certificate after you fill it in. Also need to be noted that the time allocated for our session today is basically within two hours, and that include a Q&A session with our speaker today. And therefore, the audience are free to ask their queries in the chat box at the bottom right corner of the Webex window throughout the session, or the audience can simply unmute their mic and ask their questions directly to our speaker during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I shall welcome our honorable speaker today, Professor Dr. Karim Hajri from the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom, with his lecture titled Aging in Place and Integrated Care, Findings from the Odessa Project. Allow me to briefly explain what Odessa Project is, which is to my understanding that it is an international research venture investigating current long-term care delivery models for older people to allow them to live independently for an extended period of time. And this project ran across three countries, the UK, France, and China, by identifying common features in an effective system of integrated care under different policy and social culture background. So without giving away too much, I shall give this room to our honorable speaker, Professor Dr. Karim Hajri. Please welcome, and the room is yours, bro. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, uh, Alice as well, for um, a very kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful for your invitation and for your friendship. Very good, long, long lasting uh, partnership between our two institutions, and uh, they're going from strength to strength, and we look forward to for the collaboration, uh, all aspect teaching, why they engage. So um, I thought today maybe I'll, I'll speak about this project, which was completed two years, just because of its international significance. But we, Isaac mentioned, we, we work across the countries. And so you, you imagine the challenges of, of of uh, cultural and language, etc. But uh, managed to do that uh, successfully. So th the project, um, I will explain now uh, four parts. I I'll talk about the introduction just so that you understand what the project is about. And Odessa is just an acronym. It's an acronym. You have. So we will uh, talk about age friendly environments and uh, other aspects we are responsible for producing inclusive environments. And um, as part of this inclusive environment, for example, people in wheelchairs or sensory uh, or cognitive, uh, they, we will take, take the, the, those uh, characteristics into consideration. One of them is obviously for older age. I will explain in a moment. So we looked at case studies. Uh, across Europe, China, UK, and after that, uh, once, we, once we published the exploratory study, so exploratory focus group had help you understand the challenges, for example, uh, reach some conclusions of the informed methodology. That was very useful for us and context, particularly in China. Uh, and then we did a final focus group to test the tool. After that, um, as part of another work package, which I will in a moment, we, we saw scenario uh, pilots for the field. Then uh, there were some impact activities to maximize. Uh, now, the, the project uh, is an international venture. It was part of the China expanding population time, of course. Uh, so um, at that time, there were still um, programs in collaboration. So this one was called Undefended Population. This is because China is aging much more rapidly. Countries like Japan, uh, 
But these were opportunities for me to look at some Chinese context and see their lessons very well, so think from both sides. Now, this was funded by a total of the value of the project is about one, one million years. It had the largest Uh, excuse me, Prof. Uh, pardon me. Uh, I think your voice is breaking up. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's your internet connection or your mic. Can you hear me okay now? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, but uh, it's a bit too low. It's a bit too low, I think. Um, yeah. I think your internet is fine, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the mic or the internet. I think the, the internet is good, uh, but but maybe Prof Karim need to get a little bit closer to the um, okay, speaker, um, okay. I think. I, yeah. Okay, let I, me change, uh, change the setting. I think perhaps it's best to use the um, laptop speaker or maybe the laptop mic. Meanwhile, Hello. Dr. Isaac, yeah, I think this is good. Yeah, it's clear now. It's... This is okay? Can you hear me okay yeah, now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, this it's is louder. fine. This louder. Is louder. All right. Yeah. Brilliant, okay. Okay, excellent. So you can, you can, um, you can still see the slide is there? Yes, yeah, the, the slide, slide is fine. Is... Yeah, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so, um, okay, so I say it was funded by three countries and then uh, in Paris, it was Dauphine University, which is a social science and health, uh, University and then the Tsinghua in, in Beijing, which is one of the leading universities in China. Um, so uh, obviously we started by looking at some issues or challenges uh, when we were developing the proposal. Uh, and there were uh, obviously discussions with all the partners in order to uh, you know, agree the, the best way forward and, and, and uh, develop a proposal with, uh, you know, that responds to the, the current issues. So uh, across across Europe and China, of course, not just China. So uh, these are the, the five that we, we identified at the time. Obviously, there were issues with um, the increasing demand for in-house caring, um, and and uh, lots of uh, lots of people, older people, receive care at home. Uh, in the UK, this is quite standard, and uh, in, in many many countries, there's increasing need. So we noticed that this is also the case in, in China with uh, a dramatic increase in, in, this, uh, in this demand. But we were also interested in, in what is an innovative care delivery model? What, what does it entail? What does it have? Uh, and um, uh, whether, whether this can also help maintain independence and, and improve the quality of life of all the people. So we wanted to look at how do we make this independence uh, you know, for longer, uh, for as long as possible, but also in line, uh, uh, ensuring that there is the quality of life is maintained. Now, there are also issues uh, probably, you know, and everywhere uh, it happens uh, in terms of isolation. Uh, and uh, older people, sometimes they struggle to maintain the social network, especially if they move to care home settings, lose their connections with, the with, the, with their neighbors and friends and so on. So that's quite challenging, regardless of the fact that we have the you know, social networks in, in digital formats. Uh, you know, people still need that physical contact. So overcoming isolation was a key component in that and the social networks as a result. Then uh, this is where the architecture comes in. The physical environment is often a barrier to accessibility, mobility and independence. You know that if we cannot move around in our own home and there are challenges of, of falling or hurting yourself, then that's not good. And, and we need to do a better job as, as architects and as designers. So we'll talk about that in some detail and then uh, Considering the fact that most of the housing that exists around us is actually uh, older, old, and needs retrofitting, there are really significant challenges of how to retrofit that to make it accessible uh, and, and also affordable. So I will be talking about uh, that in, in more detail in a moment. So in terms of the aims, and more or less you guessed now that we're talking about aging in place, what it means. Uh, in the three countries, we want to see 
um, how it is conceptualized, how it is understood, how it is implemented, and then what, what type of uh, integrated care is available and what are the policies uh, uh, supporting that. So we were looking obviously at, um, at these models and whether they have potential for um, replication, lessons to be learned and so on, in terms of uh, how we can improve the care, but also the living environment of all the people. So I think that's very important. We, I also had a team that looked at the financial mo means or models to support this, like uh, mortgages or remortgaging and, and, and managing equity and so on. So the project objectives, um, which uh, somehow um, align with the uh, the work packages, we had six work packages. So we looked at, um, at the housing needs and choices. We looked at uh, um, living arrangements. Uh, we looked at um, uh, connected communities, social care support. We looked at design, obviously, and the financial aspects, and then we developed a framework. Uh, we also looked at um, the uh, longitudinal surveys, the, the three, one, uh, the Chinese one, Charles, um, Elsa, in, in the UK, the English uh, longitudinal survey for uh, aging, and then there is the shared one in Europe. So we, we had lots of data to look at. So we package one and two, they examined uh, the three longitudinal uh, surveys in, in great detail and did some statistical analysis. And then work package three looked at um, connected communities uh, by doing some interviews and site visits uh, to uh, selected communities to understand how people are connected, all the people are connected and how they receive care and so on. Work package four, which I, I was uh, um, involved in heavily, it was about age friendly environment. And then the fifth one was about finance and aspect. And the last one was about developing these scenarios. So I will talk today because uh, this is a huge project, there's lots of data. I will talk about four and five uh, so that to give you an understanding of, uh, of, of the project. So in terms of framework or the methodological framework here, you could see the connections between the work packages that we looked at, you know, what are the global challenges in terms of aging, uh, is demographic trends, and, and that's why we, we found the information from the longitudinal studies and, uh, and previous uh, work. Um, and then, we looked at, um, you know, housing situations of the living environments and, and living arrangements and so on. After that, we looked into health and social care models, uh, including the aging in place scenarios, uh, the network and so on. And then after that, we developed the financial model and the framework. So the uh, at the bottom, you see comparison and scenario building was very important because um, we needed to like um, provide some scenarios based on the data we have for China, because since the aging process is so fast, they're still not at the same aging um, profile as, uh, for example, UK or France. So we thought maybe some lessons are there for us. But likewise, the Chinese um, support for um, uh, the older people, the community support is actually quite robust. And there were also lessons for Europe uh, in terms of how you deal with, uh, you know, in terms of social networks that are actually working quite well. So I will talk about those two uh, yellow boxes there. Uh, so first, let's talk about age-friendly housing environment, uh, what we did. So what we decided to uh, embark on was um, a review of best practice or good practice in age-friendly and smart homes. So we looked at the literature. Uh, there, are th there are places and, and that we are aware of, that we have visited, that we have used as case studies in other, stu in other studies. So we looked at actually UK, France, and the Netherlands uh, as, as three countries where, where we selected case study. And then after that, we looked also in China. Um, China, uh, we were very interested because we saw um, that the care homes is a, is a new concept and, and it's being developed as, as a, a, but it hasn't picked up yet compared to e Then uh, we wanted to see whether there are any potential um, replications or similarities or differences and what, what are they so that we can uh, inform the the design alternatives, you know. So the idea was to, to produce the design alternatives and guidelines for age friendly. And we did so, and I'll show you the, some illustrations later on. So in terms of methodology, so the literature review, as you can see, we had some uh, uh, topics uh, or teams to, to cover or to investigate, uh, like assistive technology, universal design, and so on, you can see. We also looked at dementia care. Uh, because that's also an important part of uh, 
you know, of looking after, uh, if you're doing it, you want an aging uh, or an age friendly environment, you also need to look about uh, not just the mobility, you, you have to uh, respond to the challenges of sensory uh, impairment, but also cognitive impairment, and, and dementia is one of those. Um, and then we looked at uh, international good practice in this area. So the findings informed the selection of case studies uh, through this and through our networks. So after that, uh, we did some uh, focus groups, which informed the retrofitting recommendations uh, or design recommendation as a whole. And after that, we had um, several focus group in, in the UK, France, and China in order to reach uh, the recommendations for the work package five and six. So to guide the case studies, we uh, we looked at four, um, four, four say, um, criteria there uh, we wanted uh, because this is good about good practice. You want to see how is it working? Is it, is it you know is it positive and what are the challenges? Uh, so inclusive design, assisted technology, that there is provision of care. So this is like the to respond to the in-house care needs, and there has to be a, quite a recent development. This is um, to limit obviously the the, the amount of, of cases that we looked at. We still looked at like forty or so. And then, uh, in terms of the user requirement, we we decided that uh, we have to ensure there is mobility, sensory, and cognitive. They're all there. Uh, they're quite critical. But we also wanted health and safety and social inclusion. So this is either like uh, physically possible or or via digital means, yeah? internet, and so on. Then, um, after that, we looked at. Um, uh, the shortlist, we produced the shortlist, as you can see here in the four countries. Um, and the total, you can see like five, six, seven, um, eight in, in the UK, and, and four in France, and five in the Netherlands, and, and four in China. China was a bit challenging because um, there are not many um, forms that were accessible to us. So, but we managed to get four, and, and we had a good idea of what's going on at the moment in terms of age friendly environments and so on. And I, I will pick up this later on because we also looked at um, building regulations for inclusive design for age friendly environments and that are quite be useful to us. So uh, it, this is changing actually in, in, in China as we speak. So anyway, um, we uh, uh, documented the case studies. As you can see here, there's uh, one in France where you can see um, there are some, we also looked at care homes, of course, because we wanted to see what seems to be working in there that can be integrated in a normal home without making it look too um, overwhelming or too hospital-like. Uh, but there's also a very interesting technology in terms of accessing um, local information, travel, uh, ordering uh, food or, or goods, um, weather, uh, news, and so on. So really there's some nice tools available uh, and. You can see there with remote control and so on. Um, it, it should be easy to use as well. And then we produced a, um, a document on, on the case studies. I can share it with you later on if you want. Um, so uh, it, it was published and distributed to the network uh, and so on. So uh, it, it just presents the, those five uh, requirements analyzed one by one and documented, obviously, with photographs and so on. So it's quite useful in terms of mapping what's out there that seems to be working quite well. And, and these were visited, of course. Uh, we looked at these places, we interviewed the managers and, and the carers, and we had a good feel of, of uh, how the place seems to, uh, was working. So that's quite an interesting piece of work, uh, which obviously uh, in the early stages of the project was very important to understand the landscape or what's going on in terms of um, age friendly uh, homes, uh, which models are being used, some are collective housing, some are individual, some look more like care homes uh, and others not. So uh, there are different, different names for them, there are different uh, interpretations across the countries. Um, so you would expect a similar thing probably in Malaysia and elsewhere. So once we had this and it was a good idea of what, what is the, you know, the manifestations of age friendliness, then we decided to go to Beijing and do some exploratory focus groups because we had enough information at that point to table it. Uh, and then we had three focus groups, as you can see here. 
um, Tsinghua, because we worked with them, they have access to a large uh, group of uh, retired university employees who live on campus. Uh, they are in 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, quite healthy and, and um, quite aware as well of um, what's going on uh, in, in terms of um, housing and, and so on. They have their own challenges because their housing is quite old on campus. It's a um, block of flats, about four, four stories or five stories. And they're still living there and they're like, I don't know, there are thousands actually. The, the campus is so big. So as a result, um, there's a large um, uh, cohort of, of retired professors and, and employees, administrative employees and so on, and still living in there. So we have access to that. Uh, group we had 12 with the first one uh, very very productive very helpful um, because there were uh, some retired uh, architects as well in there uh, who talked about their experiences and so on and i'm going to show you a sketch by one of them in a moment then we had another one which was multi-generational we had uh, three generations basically in it uh, we had in one case the daughter the mother and the grandmother uh, that was also very interesting uh, focus group. And then the last one was from um, a, a community, the Shaoyang Minjin Committee. They have, uh, they're very active actually, a social group, quite active, uh, low income. So for them, the challenges actually are, are, are quite different and, and can be uh, significant as well. So it was interesting to hear their, their voices. Um, was quite interesting as well. So in terms of what we what we talked about, um, we talked about this the the five as I say, including health and safety. But there were some um, themes that were guiding the conversation, uh, so that um, you know because there's so much uh, to cover. So we needed to like keep the focus, and that there were some specific questions asked in each. Um, uh, in each focus group, but before we we started the focus group, we presented um, the participant with what we meant, for example, by sensory. You can see an example here with some illustrations. And then there were some questions in each one. So we, we first gave them the document uh, to get them familiar with uh, these themes and concepts so they understand what we talked about. Uh, and then we showed them some illustrations so they can connect some of these, they have seen it, uh, and we have used them uh, and so on. And then after that, we ask them the questions. And you can see here, this is one of the professors, retired professor. I think he was at the time 81. And, and we were impressed because he gave us a, a, a lecture on, on inclusive design. You can see with his uh, Apple computer and so on. Really, really impressed by, by his, um, his uh, you, you know, skills and, and awareness and, and, uh, and, and, you know, fitness, he was so, he's in a very, very good shape and, and active and so on. So it's quite impressive. Um, and then this is what, the second one, which was multi-generational in, in, in another another venue. So we asked them these following questions. Um, so it's quite personal because we wanted to tell us about their own experiences in, in dealing with the challenges of aging. So for example, have they made any adaptation or modification to their uh, home because of mobility or accessibility and so on? Um, uh, if there are any sensory health or, or issues as well, uh, or they have concerns, because some do have concerns, even though they are healthy, they still worry about because they have heard or seen uh, other people experiencing such uh, impairment. But we wanted to know about independence, uh, assistive technologies as well, very important, and it's a booming market in China and elsewhere, as you would expect. Um, etc. So assistive technology was also a key component because we know that this can support us, the architects or the designers, in you know in gathering information, but also in in preventing accidents uh, for health and safety, for making you know connections, staying in touch, and so on. So it's quite important. When it needs to be acknowledged, and, and millions have been spent in this across the globe. So the technology is there. Uh, it just needs to be understood and made uh, usable. So we, um, we, this is similar. So we talked about aging in place um, as well in terms as a, a thematic uh, connection. 
Uh, and then there was some sub team that emerged from this. So, for example, uh, there, there were issues with the design or, or with the space or with with wanting to stay at home and so on. And and for the culture of the multi generational living, which is quite common in China in particular. Um, but there were other I issues in terms of you know fear of death and and the challenges of urban rural or the differences between the two, the ethical issues and so on. So these are just a. Uh, um, in a nutshell, a few of the items that emerged, or the themes that emerged, and then after that, uh, we also tried to look at what what were the um, some of the barriers really, and uh, or, or what is how do, how do they conceptualize aging in place? These are some of the of the key messages I was facing. So, you know, fear of abandonment is also seen as actually, or or fear of loneliness seems to be like when aging in place is lacking or, or when there is no aging in place and people are abandoned basically and lonely. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see the, the perspective of, of um, all the people in China from you know, what, do, what do they mean? How do they understand aging in place? And also what are the barriers to aging in place? So, for example, yeah, and this is quite quite critical, and it's uh, it's actually uh, universal. If you are unable to modify your home or install these devices to support your uh, living there, then that's it. You need to move. You need to move somewhere else that has these modifications or or these systems in place, and it is designed accordingly. So that's that's why I'm saying the challenges of retrofitting can be quite huge and complicated. Because there are lots of structures where, for example, there's no lift. What are you going to do? So sometimes it's possible to install lift from the outside. Sometimes it's not. Um, there's also the um, this medical support or care care uh, from from the health uh, support perspective. Uh, lots of people wanted to be at home, um, and then there's the affordability issues, obviously, um, to uh, access a lift or to make the uh, the home more. Um, more more accessible in terms of mobility, in particular, you know, and then some of the technology, in particular in Chinese um, health and care system, is not yet supported. So even the emergency call button is still a challenge, apparently. Anyway, so that is some of the barriers that were highlighted in this exploratory things. One of the participants in the first group, he he drew this quite quickly. So he drew the one on the left, and we translated it there on the right, and he said, "This is my ideal apartment." Very simple, he said, I, have, I just need four spaces. And you can see here uh, the balcony, for example, which is important for fun, uh, but I mean, they put fun, but it means like for enjoyment. Um, but there is a room there on the right, which has a healthcare room, medical care rehabilitation. So because they need physiotherapy, for example, uh, they need to exercise at some point, uh, or they receive a carer, and they have to. I mean, so they need, you have to start thinking that actually, this um, if you want aging in place, then you need to have a room that is capable of, uh, you know, providing this function. So it could be multifunctional. It could be a room that quickly turns into a space that, you know, that healthcare can take place, uh, or medical care can take place. So that's just a small hint of where, um, as architects, we need to focus our um, design intentions in order to answer the need of, you know, aging, because it's not the same for you know people who are healthy, younger, and so on. As an older person, that need probably they move less, and they need a safer environment to move around and so on. So that's that's quite uh, illuminating, I think. And then when we look at all the three um, focus groups, we did this, um, uh, what we call content analysis. The content analysis in this software called Envivo, it can tell you um, about the teams, the relationship between the teams, uh, and then you could also produce this like barriers and enablers. And what is interesting here is, um, maybe I start with the accessibility at the, at the very bottom, you can see there. Um, that the barriers to accessibility are quite high, uh, similarly to aging in place. So the Chinese, this Chinese group uh, of participants, they feel that actually accessibility and aging in place, they have huge barriers, significant barriers. With aging in place, seems to have also 
but more enablers, more, uh, for example, people or policies or uh, organizations trying to support it, less so for accessibility, which is, so accessibility is a massive problem. And then if we go to the very end to technology, and that's actually quite puzzling because people want it and need it, it's quite high, is the highest in there. Uh, and then yet, it the challenges and barriers are massive. And, but also the enablers are there, why? Because technology is available and it's quite cheap, yeah? But to, to install it in a house becomes quite complicated and expensive. So there are not processes still in place that make it happen, but people want, want it. So I think technology here and assistive technology in particular is really interesting area of further research um, in, in the case of China in particular. So I, I, I will move quickly now to um, the thematic analysis. Uh, the thematic analysis, obviously, uh, we, uh, as I said, we talked about accessibility, sensory and cognitive uh, and technology, and we wanted to see what are the key themes connected to this. For example, for accessibility, people talked a lot about lift, about ramps, about staircases, you know, ergonomics, the anti-slip floor, the bathrooms, and so on. So those are the key components, which are actually, we are not surprised to see them, but in the case of um, China, they have a lot of uh, block of flats, work of flats with no lift. So uh, if an older person lives on the top floor, then it becomes an incredible challenge to go down every day. And as a result, they become isolated. They are stuck unless they live on the ground floor. So um, some of them, they put money together uh, and then they, they get the company to uh, build the lift from the outside. But that's not everybody is able to do it. It's quite expensive. And sometimes even when it's done, there are still some split level floors, which means there will be still staircases to negotiate. So there's, it's, it's, it's not a complete solution. That's why designing new needs to take into consideration the accessibility issues. So in terms of sensory, um, you can see this, uh, as I progress now to cognitive, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, there is, for example, China, they talk a lot about air pollution. Uh, uh, quality, um, it seems a uh, repairing topic and it's quite a um, significant problem. Um, and the noise and um, the, the uh, thermal comfort, uh, so on. So there are quite a number of issues that people were, um, were worried about, including uh, issues that emerge as a result of living with uh, different generations. So there are also tensions there. So in terms of the cognitive, uh, I mentioned this uh, earlier, um, but um, <clears throat> the uh, isolation, dementia, and so on, you can see they've talked about dementia reluctantly, though I will say why in a moment. They talk about emotions, uh, about sleep, um, about psychological issues, but also the sense of belonging and familiarity, uh, which are quite important. Um, yeah, but then likewise, um, Loneliness is there and the feel of abandonment are all like uh, serious issues uh, that this, you know, older people are, are quite worried about uh, naturally. I mean, we all do. And then finally, the technology as the most complex one generated lots of discussion um, because it's, uh, it has lots of potential. Uh, we can see, for example, the smartphones uh, it's uh, basically a revolution in terms of what it does now. It's incredible. But there are also, also lots of other devices I will mention here, like the pill, pill dispenser and, and the smart watches and, you know, the telehealth. So things they, they know about, they've been using. Uh, but others that they think that actually quite complicated and not 3D yet. Uh, so I think it's a really interesting area for exploration. Um, in terms of which ones actually can can work quite quickly and cheaply, and with others need further work. In terms of like uh, comments, um, because we talked about um, you know uh, robots uh, providing um, their support, and, and then they say, of course, I mean, or or uh, no remote um, remote support from from a care. Uh, organization, they say, they don't think technology can replace emotion. They say emotion in care is more important. So that contact with the human, uh, between humans is so, so important. And, and they think um, 
uh, they believe in that and they, they should, it should continue. I mean, you can have technology on the sideline supporting this, but still that uh, human contact is uh, so, so important. Um, there were also lots of issues with um, uh, three generations living together, not just in terms of space, this one mentioned space, but there were also noise and um, privacy uh, and things like that. So um, it's quite common. And I think multi-generational living is, is actually uh, common across the, the globe. I'm sure in Malaysia and other places there are too. Even in the UK here, we are seeing multi-generational living increasingly uh, increasing between actually grand, even grandparents and, and grandchildren. So it's quite interesting. And then uh, finally, we felt that dementia was almost like um, an unwanted um, topic for conversation. Is it's, they were avoiding it. They didn't want to talk about it. It's quite a scary term, and uh, just because it's a it's a it's a terrible disease. It's devastating, uh, and and that's why I probably they're not really uh, ready to talk about it. So hence the, this uh, you know feeling uncomfortable about. It. So just to move on quickly, after we um, we finished that um, and with the case studies and so on, we produced um, this user requirement about 119 we developed. <laughs> Uh, that will help us uh, uh, produce this design framework for mainstream. We call it mainstream housing. And then uh, we had um, options for retrofitting because we understand that um, the, the housing stock is so huge and most of it is not really accessible in terms of uh, mobility and so on. So it needs retrofitting. So what retrofitting it needs, for example, for mobility or for sensory or, or for cognitive, etc. So we wanted to understand that. And then what technology will support, for example, uh, mobility or sensory and so on. Then we produce the spreadsheets with uh, associated um, illustrations that you can see here. Uh, and then uh, this, this spreadsheet, we produce them for the subsequent focus groups because we were going to do focus groups that were more, um, more in-depth, not exploratory. The, this focus group, you table something, you discuss it, you get feedback, and then, uh, and then you you adjust framework accordingly. This was pages and pages, of course, of that, uh, and we had them done for mainstream and for uh, retrofitting. Uh, produced them in in English and in French. So we did that um, here because we couldn't go back to China, but uh, we did one in in the UK where uh, it was very strange, but we found the care home. With Hong Kong Chinese in it, who are in their 80s, 90s, who came uh, 50 or so, 60 years ago to work in the UK and remained here. And they're living together as a small community. So we we took uh, we thought, okay, that would be an excellent idea to show something to a, a new group. So it was like really interesting conversation we had with them and, and a feedback we received with them in terms of the challenges here in the UK, experiencing you know all sorts of um, limitations and, and etc. So we um, we produced uh, the results here as you can see there were some like Likert scale um, values as well, but also some uh, comments uh, that were quite important to us, uh, and then. Uh, just to summarize the finding quickly here uh, for, uh, for age friendly uh, environments and so there were there were uh, important teams that emerged of course the wheelchair accessibility the ramp that's quite critical and the walk-in shower walk-in shower is actually very important to uh, avoid uh, falls and so on the, the bathroom in particular can be quite um, quite quite dangerous I cannot look at the Isaac. I cannot look at the question now. I will look at them later. Yeah, after I finish. Um, accessible emergency call system. Uh, that was a, a very um, um, discussed topic in, in China, in particular, because they seem to be quite problematic. Uh, and then, obviously, less importance to features that were perceived to be high assistance, like you know. Um, Sometimes they, they look like it's in a hospital, so I, I think people don't want to see that. For the sensory, the daylight was quite important. 
uh, also outdoor views from the inside. They they're good for for uh, your well-being, psychology, and so on. It's really important. Uh, and then uh, the, the technology or home automation for health and safety, or, or for support in, in general. Then for the cognitive, um, they say uh, they talked a lot about uh, memory and orientation. So I think um, when designing architects need to be aware of that. Like uh, if you produce a symmetrical design where it's difficult to know which in which side you are, imagine an older person with some cognitive or neurodivergent uh, impairment, they, they are not gonna find their way. So you will just complicate it. So you need to think about how you produce a design that is, um, Quite distinctive. Where in in each place you know exactly where 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 you, where you are by you know using features, color schemes, and so on. Uh, and then, um, like uh, probably you have seen in many places, there is this memorabilia. People use their own photographs and own objects in order to identify places and help them also with uh, with wayfinding. So that's also important, very important uh, for for the participants. And then in terms of group discussion, we talked about uh, homes for life. At, because when you say aging, you say, okay, why don't we just design homes for life? Homes that they don't need to be changed, but it's difficult actually. Um, can, can, for example, housing evolve with people as we age? Uh, can we predict how we're gonna live in 50 years time? I mean, just look at the pandemic. Two years ago, working from home, very few people were doing it. Now you had billions stuck at home and lots of people didn't have the, the space uh, and the means to work effectively from home. So maybe from now on, we should take that into consideration as well. Like, because working from home, we continue for a while, for sure. But just an example, of course. Um, so uh, this this concept of uh, of home, Fitted for old age, uh, maybe not the solution, but something that is universal, that is forward-looking. That that possibly that's the best solution. I think one way of talking about that is is this future proofing. You know, you don't want to make it too complex, uh, but you need to try to understand. Or try to, um, you know, identify what the future proofing might look like. So that could be a really good exercise in terms of designing homes. Now with the technology, um, you know, all these social networks and so on. How how future home is going to look like, but also how a low cost future home is going to look like. Because it's not about putting this uh, fancy, expensive smart home gadgets. And there you go. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something low cost, accessible to the masses, but it is future proof, it is safe, it has the basic technology that it needs, and so on. Most for health and safety, for social connections and the like. So we produce for the sake of the exercise an accessible typical apartment. Why? Because most of the apartment in China, in China most of the housing is actually apartments. Um, obviously the, um, the sizes vary, but we 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 use the universal design uh, approaches here to produce that. This is uh, just for illustration purposes. We wanted to see how much we can fit, but also we wanted to bring this um, technology with the design. As you can see here, the numbers. I'm sure, whether you can read, right? like number one is the telephone with large buttons. Number two is the remote control. Uh, with different colors, number three, the smoke detectors, number four, the smoke alarms, then infrared monitoring system, five, six, daylight sensors. You know, there are lots of things that you can, as an architect, you know, we design and then we bring the electrician to do the electricity, bring the uh, um, mechanical engineer to do HVAC and so on. But then, but, but things are changing. So the architects, designers, interior designers need to be aware actually that if you are designing, um, on future proofing and using technology, these are the type of technology that we need for mobility, for sensory, for cognitive, for health and safety, and so on. So I think it's important to to have an idea what are these so they can be integrated into the design, and then um, there will be 
uh, you are protecting them from emergencies, but also you are providing uh, the, the health and care that can be integrated into their, uh, their homes. So some of the uh, profiting options for uh, bedrooms, say, uh, as you can see, this number five, for example, is the ceiling height. Why? Because at, there are some people who uh, are, are not mobile, they need to be lifted into their wheelchair and so on. So the ceiling height is actually one of those uh, key criteria we have in the UK in, in our lifetime home standards. So if that is um, uh, installed at the beginning, then it will be much cheaper than bringing a new one and trying to break the, the ceiling and so on. Same for the kitchen, uh, some uh, six, for example, adjustable height movable kitchen, it can be done manually or, or it could be with a uh, vehicle that's, uh, that's available at the moment. So not a problem, but there are also some safety issues in the kitchen in particular. It can be quite, quite a dangerous place for all the people. Uh, and, and possibly the most dangerous, challenging one is the bathroom. Uh, so there are here some examples of um, additions uh, in making it as safe as possible. All right, so uh, 45 minutes, I have maybe another 10 minutes and I finish. Uh, I just talked now about the future scenario, which is actually um, something new. Um, we wanted, based on the information we received, to try to like um, create some scenarios for uh, older people. So this table is actually quite big. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, uh, you can see SHARS, which is the China Health and Retirement Longitudinal Study. Uh, that, uh, that longitudinal survey, which is accessible, you can, you can look at it and download data and so on. We produced data, as I said, in World Package 1 and 2 about China, of course. Uh, like you can see the age uh, the age group 60 to 70 and, and so on. So we found some patterns in here uh, about the number of children that they have, about whether they live with partner or not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have data there. That data, we use it to um, generate some a list of problems or keywords, keyword problems, and then identify some existing support. For example, they, they live with their children in the same neighborhood, uh, or the children visits weekly uh, because it, it is available in the da in the data, okay. And after that, uh, what what do they what do they do uh, in order to future proof uh, in, in that area? So, for example, in terms of health, or in terms of social care, or in terms of design or technology, the blue text. And after that, just follow the arrows. We had um, three work packages. One, the number three about health and social care and, and, and social networks. The four, which is the one I was talking about, design and technology uh, for age friendly environment. And then there was one on finance. So this information was used to produce um, a combination uh, of scenarios that take into consideration all these uh, connections and data. So it's, it's quite, actually, it's quite real. It's not something um, fictitious, but the way we combine them is to make them as plausible as possible. For example, you can see the position map in the middle. The top right is actually very positive uh, scenario. The bottom left, where it becomes red, slightly red, number eight and nine is actually are the worst case scenarios. And those in the middle, in the diagonal in the middle, uh, bottom uh, right to top left, they are like so-so. Um, uh, and then there are another three, which is six, five, six, and seven, that are not as bad as eight and nine, but are quite, quite bad. Too. So I think this is an important way of visualizing them. And then each one was different. Sometimes it's a couple, sometimes it's just one individual. Yeah? And, and then we looked at... Um, uh, the, the mobility, whether poor or good mobility, sensory cognitive um, conditions, and we looked at the physical health. So they're quite separate. You know, physical health could be problems with breathing or heart problems or, or something else. Whereas the mobility, the sensory, and the cognitive, they are, uh, you know, about how they feel in that space. They can use it, they cannot use it, they get lost, they get confused and so on. So those two combinations, sometimes they make things really 
really complex. So just to show you a close up of two, um, which is scenario one is the most positive, just so to have an idea. Um, they, they, they have a risk of stroke, for example. Uh, they have uh, organized daily activities. Uh, know what their future needs are, but uh, the children live in the neighborhood and then um, they need advice uh, for help. There is social care available. There is uh, the design needs to be uh, planned to improve mobility needs and technology. So the blue is that what they're going to need in order to to live uh, even better. Okay. So the red is the challenges, the situation they are having. The, the green is the support they have, and the blue is what we need to give them in those categories. Yeah. So scenario five slightly more difficult. This is an 82 year old. Uh, uh, she has a knee surgery, she is on a wheelchair, she needs a regular physiotherapy, has step access to lift, which is a problem, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, she has had five children in the city, there is a lift okay, uh, and then the visiting physiotherapist, of course. And then, but we need we need to give them more more health support, more social care support, and the design need to take into consideration the mobility and sensory and the technology need to take into consideration also mobility needs, medication, and so on and so forth. So once we did this uh, 12 scenarios, we put them into a public consultation in Beijing. That was a very interesting event. Uh, we presented all of them in posters, like you can see there, all the 12, and we had uh, uh, our team there helping with the um, with the event, we gave this um, one page um, questionnaire to everybody who watched, uh, read, understood the scenario to write about, um, to give us um, um, responses, for example, about plausibility and the importance and the value of the scenario uh, from strongly agree to strongly disagree or do not know. And then at the bottom, we asked them about um, how they feel about it, is it optimistic, uh, pessimistic, um, fair, or, or they don't know, and whether they accept or reject or they don't know about the scenario. So I think it's a really uh, interesting way of collecting the, the information. You can see it was very, quite busy. Um, and then we had, uh, each scenario had one student from Tsinghua who was uh, trained and briefed about it so that they can explain it to the participants and help them with the uh, responses. And then, um, I said that we, we collected the information about those uh, two events. And then uh, we got uh, 215 responses, 152 female, 57 male, and then the mean age was 68 years old. The optimism was 0.76 and the acceptance was 0.89, just as a, as a guidance really. Uh, and then here there's a little bit more detail about uh, the optimism versus the acceptance levels. Um, <clears throat> 91, it says here acceptance. Um, so they, they were concerned about social and community support solutions. Um, the blue, the, you know, the blue text, the blue uh, illustrations that we had, infographics that we had, uh, the emergency healthcare system, uh, whether the retrofitting is up to date or not. And then they want to, to see that in, this retrofitting has inspections. Uh, system in place because they they seem to be uh, unsure of how this is going to be implemented. So I think it's a good lesson for us and to understand sure proofing of um, of housing in the case of China. So um, they also talked about uh, living arrangement consideration uh, because that varies quite a lot. Uh, social community family support, health solution, the profiting options, and the financial model, which we were going to do anyway, which we did, and then the regulations and so on. So, uh, so there, there are obviously lots of other things which I don't have time to talk about, but in, in a nutshell, these are one of the key um, um, points that emerged from that. Yeah. And then uh, quite quickly, we did um, we did some impact. Just before the pandemic, uh, we went to China, but we also had one uh, at the Royal Institute of British Architects here in London on the 1st of March, and we had the, the, the one in China on 3rd of December. And then we set up also this Anglo-Chinese Aging in Place Knowledge Development Exchange Network, which I think we could do something similar with, with UTM as well. Uh, we, can, we may call it housing, uh, knowledge and development exchange, something like that. 
it would be uh, quite helpful. Uh, then we produced some documentation, which we call it a policy and practice impact document. I think it was a really good piece, uh, and also translated to Chinese. And it looked into um, how we can promote aging in place, uh, this age, age friendly housing environment and, and connected communities. So we used uh, the connected communities concept here a little bit uh, more. So we had some policy recommendations. Uh, we had some practice guidelines. I can also share this document with you if you are interested. And we also did a mapping of um, the laws or the regulations uh, regarding uh, accessible, inclusive design and so on. There are some, as you can see, the, the law for the for the older people from 2015, uh, and then one promoting um, livable environment 2016, and then there is this 13 five year plan. Um, this uh, aging and, and pension system, which is uh, actually some of it maps with our work. So we did the mapping where it's mentioned, not mentioned, this long document, obviously. And uh, because it was important for us to um, to understand whether whether the ODESA findings somehow uh, are mapped well or not. And if they're not mapped in some areas, then that's the room for us to inform the Chinese government about that. And likewise, there are things that I presented here in the Royal Institute of British Actors, but the Chinese good practice that can be really good uh, for us in the UK. And likewise, in France, we also did some lots of dissemination in Paris uh, at Dauphine. And even with those publication that uh, was released only two or three weeks ago in French about the Odessa project. So uh, the French had a little bit more time than us. So there were lots of uh, conference publication produced. Also, I can share this with you or is there for the download. I will also send you this presentation in PDF later so you can click on the downloads. The symposium publication. This is the symposium in China with the British Council there, the lady in the middle, and people from Tonji and, and Tsinghua and elsewhere in Hong Kong and so on. So we, we also invited some guest speakers there to help us with the, the things. So, um, so the impact creation, as I said, uh, led to these two items. Uh, I think that's about it. And this is my team, my small team here that helped me with the with with the work. Um, G uh, research uh, associates and and uh, and David from the uh, University of Central Lancashire, Professor David Morris. Uh, we produced three publications uh, on the project so far. They're there, uh, two in aging and social change, and one in technology, knowledge, and society. They were all about this, the, the work that I presented to you. So that's that's that. 57, 58 minutes. Thank you so much. I hope you find this useful, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I think I stopped sharing. Is that okay, or I leave it? Just in case I need to show again, I leave it then. I need to look at the. Just leave it, bro. Uh, yeah, I leave it. I I saw some chats. Yeah, let me open the chat so I can see what's going on. Okay, um, it's okay. Uh, I will read the question later, Prof. Karim. Yeah, well, yeah, whatever All right. you feel. All right. Lots so, of, yes. yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Karim. I think it's a very interesting research endeavors done by Prof. Karim and his team. Uh, now that Odessa already added Netherlands as part of the focus group, perhaps this effort should include Malaysia as well in the future collaboration with UTM, for example. I think we have Dr. Ellis here as well, who also did a lot of research on elderly. And we have Sheffield alumni here as well, uh, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Izora. And uh, this could be a very interesting collaboration. And I also could be part of the uh, part of the team as well in Malaysia, <laughs> if you're interested course, to course, further yeah. the research, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, I think uh, we have arrived at our next session, which is the Q&A session. And I would like to open it. Uh, should you have any question, uh, especially from the audience, you can open the mic and feel free to ask your question directly to our honorable speaker here, or you can type in your, uh, you can type in your question in the chat box and I will read each and every question depending on the time available. Okay, Prof Karim, I think we have like, uh, pardon me, uh, I think we have like uh, seven questions so far that I gathered from the audience. All right, for the first question. All right. In your opinion, what is the best practice design to accommodate the elderly in terms of planning and elderly behavior as the case study may also be influenced by the different style of living and culture as the elderly is much uh, influenced by daily culture? Prof. Karim? Yeah. yeah, of course, um, definitely very good point. And I think um, 
I think what uh, what we are trying to do is is to engage all the people in 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 co-design. Uh, I think if you listen to their concerns, um, then you will be able to um, visualize that and produce solutions so that they are, um, you know, a contributor. Because um, when you are young, you don't perceive um, the same challenges as an older person who has uh, mobility challenges or maybe sensory challenges. Also, um, if if architects stick only to the building guidelines, the building guidelines so far, they only look at mobility. Even here in the UK, only like two months ago, they started producing um, a new guidance on uh, neurodivergent cognitive impairment because they realize that there are some people who get lost in the built environment because there is no signage, it's confusing and, and so on and so forth. So the sensory doesn't exist yet. You know, um, so there are, uh, I see, I see that um, uh, the design guidelines or, or laws need, need to consider all those um, features. So that's why we looked at the mobility, the sensory, the cognitive health and safety, and also how you bring the technology in. And so I think if you put this together in front of all the people, yeah, um, and engage them in this co-production or co-design, you will produce something that is much more um, likely to be successful. However, there are cultural challenges. Uh, to do that in China is, is a mountain to climb. It's uh, really complex and difficult because um, there are lots of barriers. There are institutional barriers, there are political barriers and so on. Um, maybe easier to do, say, in the UK, um, I'm not sure about France, even between France and the UK, there are significant differences. Um, the Dutch, um, the Dutch seems to be, how do I say, the case that we saw were more um, cutting edge. Uh, they are, uh, I don't think they are, they don't, they are not afraid of risks in Holland. They take, if you, if you, if you want to know, for example, about dementia care in Holland, they do things that are incredible that they will never happen in the UK. The UK would never let them happen because the way we, um, how do you say, um, the cultural limitations and the cultural barriers, so it won't allow them. So I, I think in Holland we were really um, interested to in see how they deal with very controversial topics. You know, like uh, caring for people with dementia in, in, in Holland is very different from the UK and France. And, and there are lessons there, of course. Um, and um, yeah, so as I said, even in Europe, there are significant um, cultural differences. The south of Europe, Spain, Portugal, Italy, the way they look after the elderly is completely different from the northern Europe. There are significant, uh, we, when we looked at the longitudinal um, surveys, we saw that uh, the children, for example, location uh, where they live vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their parents, but also where all the people age, they, they, they age in the community uh, with their families in Southern Europe more so than in Northern Europe. So there are significant differences and there are cultural really. So I think it's important to be aware of the culture, to engage with the lo local, uh, all the people, um, and obviously to learn from experiences, both positive and negative, if I, if I'm, if I'm Hope I answered that question. Okay. Um, I hope that answered the question. All right. Okay. So we have question number two from the audience. All right. In your opinion, what is the best design practice uh, in terms of planning to cater for multi generational living as the cost of living now is high and many young generations prefer to live with their parents? Yeah. 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 Thank you. That's also an excellent question. Um, there was one case study we visited in northern uh, in Holland, and it was in the city called Groningen or Groningen, and they had um, they had uh, it was designed and built as a tower block uh, with with multi generational living in, in mind, and um, it had uh, also a care home in the base in, in the ground floor. It has a nursery. Um, and then it has a uh, flats for families or for or for single uh, couples and so on. So um, it had different things, but the only thing that um, we felt seemed to be like 
interesting is the fact that they co-located the care home with the nursery. They wanted all the people to see children and the noise and this and that. So that, that sense of normality, so that the care home doesn't feel like care home only when, you know, um, sometimes it can get really hard for all the people because they don't see what's going on outside. So we thought that ground floor um, dynamic was really, really interesting. Um, I am not so sure about um, like uh, the, the living in the apartment, uh, um, three generations living together uh, or two generations living together. It depends. Here in the UK, because of um, the economics, we are seeing that lots of grandparents are living with their grandchildren, not with children, with their grandchildren, because they move, uh, you know, parents moved on, but the grandchildren want to come back and they say, oh, they, can, can we live together? And they are, so they are company for the grandparents, you know, they're with them, they help them and so on. And the other ones, they have a roof over the, their heads because otherwise it's difficult to find accommodation. So there are some economic challenges that are, how say, supporting this multi-generation living. In, in Southern Europe, it happens maybe because of the culture. You know, you stick, you stay with your parents until late, until you get married and move on. And even sometimes people get married and stay with their parents, maybe because the space is there and so on. So there are significant cultural differences between um, between the various you know parts of the world. Uh, China in particular seems to be, you know, they have this multi generational living uh, almost across the board, and and um, and it, it comes with its own challenges. Obviously, if there are poor and a small apartment, it's, uh, it's quite quite uh, quite difficult. So I don't have I don't have best practice in, in a sense, uh, apart from what I've, we have seen in in Holland. Uh, the rest is ha happening organically. It's just people moving with each other, uh, and, and you know, looking at opportunities uh, whether they can do it or not. Yeah, but uh, just to add, we have uh, in the Master of Architecture, the part two, we have one studio. If you are interested, if this particular person is interested, I can put them in touch with Satwinda Samra, who runs multi generational housing studio. And I think they have done some really interesting work because they go to the communities and they ask. Uh, lots of questions and then they produce some really interesting design and sometimes the combination of functions in in the housing um, that they produce is, is the one that motivates this intergenerational engagement so that's that's another possibility okay thank you prof karim okay another question question from the audience number three in the case of beijing uh, a very dense city uh, some of the respondents are living in the limited space in an apartment with three generations living together in your opinion, do you think that the elderly should be driven out of the city, probably live in the outskirts or even rural, and just leave the younger generations living in the city? No, no way, no way. No, of course not. Because if you remove them and, and you push them out, it's uh, you are uprooting them. And the criticism that uh, we we received from older people in in Beijing is that um, uh, they don't want to go. To, to care homes, the, especially the new care homes, they are all in the outskirts. Uh, we visited some of them and they were quite empty, uh, simply because people don't want to move to the outskirts, far, far from their network. Uh, so imagine these people have been living in those parts of Beijing for a long time. They have their own friends and, and this, and they go for the walks and they meet in the parks and they exercise in the local uh, square and, and parks and so on. So uh, uh, moving them, that's not the solution, but um, helping them to stay there by retrofitting their environment and their housing to enable them to live as, as long as possible in there. That's the, that's the way forward. And I have a PhD student who is about to finish study on aging in place uh, in, in Nanjing. And, and she's looking at all this. She, she, you know, she looked at housing typologies. She looked at uh, interviewed people, uh, older people. What are the design challenges and so on? So there's some similarities, a little bit of uh, or uh, uh, with with this age aging in place, how we can enable it, because that aging in place is actually the best way forward, not just for the people but also for governments and, and institutions, because everybody wins if we can we can implement. Thank you, Prof Karim, for your answer. I hope you answered the question. Uh, another question, question number four. Uh, the rising cost of living, limited options, 
chronic health problems and inaccessibility caused by decreased mobility are just some of the housing problems facing the elderly population. What is the best design practice for the low and modest income seniors uh, are having trouble finding safe housing they can afford, but that can still meet their changing physical needs? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, the, um, if we talk about the Chinese uh, context, the Chinese older generation uh, is used to this uh, social housing that was provided by the government. Even, for example, Tsinghua University, which is one of the biggest universities in the world, has, I think, if I remember well, about 8,000 retired employees living on campus. Imagine there's a city in the campus that is only for the retired employees because they cannot kick them out. It's their right. That apartment is their right until they die. So they cannot. But the new generation, they have to go and buy their apartment. So Tsinghua and the government is not providing them with this. So you you save your money or whatever and then get your your apartment. Uh, and that's it. That's your problem. But the older generation, that was the expectation. The same expectation they have for health and, and social care. They say, why do I have to pay for it? It needs to be provided by the government. So everything in their mentality, because they grew up like that, they think it should be that way. And things have changed. I mean, China, you have to pay and it's quite expensive. Yeah. So um, low income. I mean, there is housing. If you look when the property market opened in China, there is all sorts of cost. There is the low cost, the middle cost, there's high cost. It depends on how much you can afford. And, and obviously, there is a government provided um, cheap housing as well for some section of the population. I'm not sure exactly how it is allocated, but to produce low cost uh, housing for seniors, um, I think you need to take. Uh, into consideration the, the building regulations in the particular country we are looking at. Here, if we, if we, if you, in the UK, if you are going to build low cost housing, you still have to follow uh, what we call Part M building regulations, which is about accessibility. You have to do it by law, otherwise, you will not be, uh, you will not receive planning permission and, and you will have problems. So, so whatever you do, low cost, middle cost, high cost, it has to be accessible to uh, not just all the people to everybody because there are people who are young but they have mobility issues they are on a wheelchair and so on so we need to take care of that but um yeah so i think i think it's about uh, the context we are talking about is about what um, uh, construction or design guidelines there are in place and how the housing sector works the uh, you know the balance between the low income social housing we call here in the uk and the the private sector, where you have to buy and pay for it and through a mortgage or through cash or etc. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Karim. Another question, question number five. The term fitted for old age sounded too broad to be understood and probably too early to tell due to changing perceptions of the elderly. For example, the preferences of the elderly in 2021 is different than those of in the future, say 2050s. Is there some, some kind of spectrum or criteria that can further explain the notion of a house that fitted for old age? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, I think I said earlier that um, if you just take uh, into consideration the pandemic, what it has done to us in two years, <laughs> I mean, working from home became a revolution. And lots of houses, they're not really not fitted for that and, and um, physical space, but also uh, internet connections and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, to say uh, to design for 2050, uh, it's incredibly difficult. First, because um, there could be new regulations. Uh, they could be, for example, we're talking about um, sustainable design, climate emergency. Um, we could be faced by significant uh, problems uh, with climate, maybe the temperature will go to 2.5. Second, we may have uh, sea level change. We may have so many problems. So we can I cannot. Uh, when when we talked about housing fit for old age is uh, or for aging, it's incredibly difficult. I, I totally admit, and I don't think I have the answers. All I can say is that if we take into consideration um, not just accessibility or mobility, but also that we 
at some point we will have sensory issues. At some point we will have co cognitive or neurodivergent issues. Um, and then uh, we need to be in a healthy and safe place, okay? And we need to be connected to our loved ones and the friends and the, the health and the social care in general connected uh, so that if there's an emergency, they come to you and so on. To enable this aging in place, if all this, you know, package of things are um, put together in a very coherent, uh, effective way, then you will be designing for long term. You know, if you look here in the UK or maybe in Malaysia and other places, you can see a house that was built in the 50s, 60s, and you are living in it. Uh, you can see that the plumbing actually is not there. The electrical is also collapsing. You have to change. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that don't work. You want to install devices, you can't because the walls are too thick or the concrete in the wrong place. And there are, of course, challenges. So we need to we need to think um, about um, you know how we dealt with all the buildings, but also the, the, I think the change, the technological change is so fast, is so unpredictable that I don't know really. Maybe in twenty years' time. Um, how we will be communicating, you know? Um, look at this, this only a few years ago, we were struggling to have um, online meetings, more than five, six people we used to crash and stuff like that. So now we are having hundreds. I have meeting with 500 people at some point with the school. So really it, it is, it is changing, but all we can do, as I say, is just combine those five criteria uh, and be creative. Uh, about that. That's all I can say, really. Otherwise, it's very difficult, honestly. honestly. <laughs> all right, Prof Karim. Okay, uh, we have uh, last two questions uh, that I gathered so far. Uh, in your opinion, is it suitable for the elderly to live in high rise housing apartments? If there is no choice, how to design an apartment that can cater for fire safety for the elderly? You know, I, I, yeah, I think high rise is not a problem. I mean, there are. Um, there are lots of people, older people living in high rise. Uh, there are lifts and, and safe and uh, comfortable, no problem. We uh, we are doing um, a project with Thailand, Bangkok, and Katset Sart University, and we are looking at actually a low low income uh, housing settlement uh, near the port. And uh, those people uh, they want to be evicted. They, they want to evict them to remove them from there and put them in high rise. The problem is these people never lived in a high rise. They lived on the ground floor all their lives. Not only that, they have um, like shops and stands, they sell food and, and all sorts, which means um, their housing is their livelihood. So their housing is their job. So if you take them from there and stick them on floor 20, you kill them. You basically kill them. Uh, there will be no livelihood, no income. Uh, they, don't, they don't know, maybe they have never been in a lift uh, so imagine that. So there are situations where high rise is no, no, right? Because it doesn't fit the way of life of these people. But there are others who grew up in, in World Cup, uh, like the cases we had in, in China, in four or five story apartment blocks, who if you've moved them to a high rise and there are uh, good communication and, uh, and uh, circulation, then I don't think it's going to be a problem because we have we have case studies that we see in that were high rise and, and people seem to be okay and they have open space uh, outside the, the tower blocks and so on and they seem to be okay with that. But obviously, high rise has its own challenges. You know, um, there's less likelihood of meeting your neighbors and uh, there's the density issues and, and potentially noise and other things. So I think people like, I would say, low rise, high density, low middle rise. Uh, even in my teaching, that's what I encourage. You know, low middle rise, high density, beautifully done. Uh, that can be the way forward. But those towers, they're just crazy. I mean, they, I don't think it's the best way forward. Okay, Prof Karim, thank you for the answer. Uh, last question that I gathered, uh, question number seven, the inclusion of technology and healthcare spaces within a house could make the cost of living to rise significantly. Do you think that in your suggestion for policy, the inclusion of these spaces and technology would further widen the gap between the rich and the poor, 
especially in a big city like Beijing? Yeah, I would say yes and no. Yeah, yes, um, because if you start implementing it across the board, it is very expensive and it needs the infrastructure. Just the internet for the whole city is a nightmare situation for any any country. So imagine, I don't know, 20 million or so. So there is a government provided, uh, I would say, scheme to uh, allow for basic um, basic infrastructure to be installed, obviously, like emergency call button and things like that. And uh, there are the rest is driven by by the private sector. The technology um, is getting cheaper and cheaper. Really, it's becoming very affordable. Like the smartphone, for example, smartphone 10, 15 years ago, who had smartphones? Very few people. Now everybody has a smartphone. Even in the poorest of poorest countries, they have smartphones. Okay? Not only that, um, because of the mobile network, there is no need for, uh, I don't know who has a landline. Who uses landline now? Very few people. Landline all of a sudden is like, you know, so there are um, cheap alternatives now to uh, being connected. You know, uh, so the infrastructure um, can, is not as challenging as it used to be when, you know, when we had the wired, the wired one. So there is that, and there are schemes uh, by government to uh, install this this technology, you know. But I'm not talking about, you know, those sophisticated smart homes that you see in magazines and programs or TV, because not that. We are, like, the images I showed, those are the basic minimum requirements for health and safety and connectivity. If we manage to do that, uh, and these are uh, included in policy and practice guidelines, so that architects when they're designing, they say, actually, I need to provide connection here, I need to provide safety buttons here, I need to do this and that. So that's it, it becomes mainstream. Like the antenna, you know, the TV antenna is the best example. Almost all homes, when they are built, they have the TV antenna. So, so they're going to have the internet uh, connection. They're going to have the safety button connection and others. So it can be done as long as it is, like you say here, um, suggestion for policy and, and practice. When I say practice is a building standard guidance. But it's clearly um, put that it's not just about the building, it's about also this technology to enhance, uh, you know, the livability and, and produce uh, this health and safety um, protection and so on. So that's how I see it, hopefully, um, if we all do our bit, maybe it will become easier as we progress. Thank you, Prof Karim. Um, is there a further question? Uh, any question that um, your audience still want to ask Prof Karim here? Our speaker. Um, can I have just the last question, uh, Prof Karim? It, it's very interesting when you talk about the Odessa project. So is this Odessa project is uh, self-funded by the university or is it funded by the government? And and what is the time frame to conduct the surveys? Uh, because I see it, it took you about two years to complete the study and to get the survey data and things like that. And uh, maybe you could explain a little bit on the Odessa and and. How many countries are participating in, in Odessa, and is it still open to other participants from all around no, the world? No, it's not open anymore. Uh, yeah. So this was um, a competition, um, and uh, so they gave only eight projects. I don't know how many applied. Maybe 50, 40 applied. Uh, the condition was three universities, two uh, two from Europe and one from China. That was the condition number one. The condition number two is a topic about understanding population change. Uh, it's EU-China collaboration. So you have to show the relationship, how you're going to collaborate. So that's why we built a team around uh, with Tsinghua and, and the, the French, Dauphine and us. We submitted the proposal. We had to develop the proposal over a few months. Submitted the proposal, it was reviewed, and then it was awarded by those three agencies, here is the, uh, here is the United Kingdom Research uh, Council. It's a government institution that gives awards monies for research in a competitive bid. You have to compete, you know, so it's not like... Uh, likewise, the French, they got uh, from the, the similar um, agency, and the Chinese also, they have the National Science Foundation of China. 
very important in the biggest search. They give them, I don't know, like 100,000, 30 euros, 130,000 euros. Um, yeah, so that's how it did. And then we, we worked uh, for three and a half years, uh, 2015, 2019. Uh, and then the French, they had one more year. I don't know why, but the French organization there, they gave them four years. So that's why they finished only like three months ago. Um, but there were some delays with COVID as well. But we did the uh, all the data collection, the analysis together. Uh, the French, they had one more year to do the publications and dissemination, basically. That's what they gave them one. Us, we had only six months. So we did, as we did, we did those impact, uh, what we call them impact creation. That's why we went back to China and we did the symposium there and we did one uh, big one here in um, in uh, London. But I also had a very big conference uh, here in Sheffield uh, where we presented all the findings. We had more than 100 people attending from all over the UK and Ireland. Yeah, so, but what we are trying to do now is, is the next steps, which is how to um, influence policy and practice, and particularly in China, because here we managed to to do quite a lot, and, and there is a new uh, regulations on uh, neurodivergent uh, impairment, so that's good. So what's happening here, things are actually quite positive. But in terms of assistive technologies, which is one of the question here, I think there's still a lot to do. So there could be um, there could be uh, ways to explore this further uh, for mainstream housing. So how mainstream housing can have this assistive technology to support aging in place, for example. But that really could be an interesting uh, way forward. Um, there are other, of course, other challenges like the scenarios that I proposed there. We could also explore them further uh, to see uh, if we can get closer to reality as much as we can. And, and what does it mean for policy and practice, so for example, in China or in another country? Uh, the work we're doing with Thailand, it's, it's also about aging in place. But for really the poorest of the poor who are, you know, if you remove them from there, you're going to take their livelihood, you're going to destroy their lives and so on. So uh, we're also exploring this with Indonesia. So we just submitted a proposal to uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council here two days ago to work with Kasset Saad and University of Indonesia there are some architects, alumni like you, they're alumni of Sheffield. So we put a bit together to work uh, about uh, low income uh, housing and livelihood for people living in, in really uh, poor areas uh, of Indonesia and, uh, and Thailand. Uh, so there is all good work there. So we need to explore similar things with you. What are your challenges in terms of housing? Uh, which groups are um, at risk? Um, what aging in place means in the context of Malaysia, for example, um, uh, what is the, the, the extent of um, technology uh, integration in, in the housing? What, what is good practice there? Uh, how do you deal with care homes? There are lots of questions really that um, we could explore that built on the work that we have done in Odessa. So we, you could do case study reviews, you could do focus groups with people to explore things and, and and many, many other things um, uh, could be available to us. So, yeah, so that's that's there. Uh, we have policy and practice documents and so on. We have done dissemination and impact creation. Now is that, what what else? Now then the pandemic, because we were exploring lots of things with China, then the pandemic came and China closed. So we cannot go there, it's difficult. So we need to explore with you, for example, even if it's online like this, whether we can start progressing um, some some ideas, and like you said uh, in a few weeks ago, and and also think about where uh, where the funding is, where where can we go to ask for funding in order to do some collaborative work. So we have some ideas here, but you have to tell us also what are your issues that you would like to explore uh, as a collaborative work. Okay, good. I think that's 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 a. Uh that's a very sharp and good answer uh prof karim we can we can actually move from there actually from from odessa as a model framework and test it in malaysia and things like that 
Okay, this sure. is wonderful. Yep. I think I need to have a long discussion with you afterwards. Yeah, yeah, we should. <laughs> not not yeah, we today, should. not today. I know you're busy, I know, but I maybe know. another time. <laughs> yes, on this, of course. Anytime. Anytime. All right. Okay, I think uh, that's all for queries, questions. So I have to close the Q&A session since we have reached almost the time given. All right, so now I would like to ask all of the attendees to open your cameras as I would like to take a screenshot photo of our session today to commemorate our adjunct professor I stopped chatting, public right? lectures I stopped number one. But I'm not sure whether the audience can open the cameras or not, Dr. Alice. I'm not so sure uh, with the with the new Webex system. I don't know why all the attendees are yeah, and they are put in a different box. So I think it's only us. It's okay. It's okay. I think it's only us. <laughs> So there's just three of us here. <laughs> yeah, I think one of us. Yeah. But, but, I think that's fine. But the audience is actually 125 participants. Yeah. yeah oh, we, okay. Yeah. But I just take the picture, by the way. Anyway, so uh, Prof. Karim, I need I need you to smile. Dr. Elise also as well. Okay, one, sure. two, and three. Okay, done. Simple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Karim. And no, you're welcome. I think, for yeah, me. I really like the Odessa project, and and maybe I think we need to extend it to Malaysia and look into the housing condition in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. So, I think next time, next time I can talk about the um, the project we have done with um, Thailand. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's wonderful actually to yeah. to hear the one that you're going to do with um UE right Universitas Indonesia also I think that's, that's very interesting because we also have our partnership with India now and uh, I think it'll be lovely also if you can have a PhD colloquium because I I just now I heard that you mentioned some of the few PhD students who did on the multi generational housing so that is that is actually if she can share her research with our PhD student also here and we also have masters part 2 student also focusing on housing so I okay. think this is quite good if you can have a, a one day a PhD or master's class. Yes, yep. yes, absolutely. Yep. I have a few yep. doing some really work, nice work and, and it'd be yeah. good to hear from your students as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, course. that'd be wonderful. Yeah. So I'll keep okay. you in touch okay. and with Tanvil yeah. also. Yep. Yes, okay, yes, so. let's do that. Yep. Let's do that. Yep. It has been, good, been a good sharing session today. Thank you so much, yes. Prof. Karim. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you both. Thank you, Karim. All the Thank best. Thank you, and, and Prof. Karim, you for too. being our guest today. Okay, You're welcome, Thank you so much. So Thank please you. do bye keep bye. in touch. So bye bye. Thank Have you. a nice day. Thank you all day. for attending. Okay. Have a good day. Bye for now. Okay. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye bye. bye.